Today I'd like to talk about the importance of the Seventh-day Adventist pioneers, uh, our history, uh, the, the context of our mission and who we are. I think it's best explained by understanding the prophecies, uh, particularly in the books of Daniel and the book of Revelation. What I'd like to give the setting for to start with is basically uh, the, the pattern of the prophecies that are given there. In Daniel's prophecies, he's given a view of world history from his day until the end, until God's kingdom. And God's kingdom is set up and it lasts forever. And in Daniel's visions, there are basically four kingdoms that are pictured. The fourth kingdom is diverse or different from all the others. And after the fourth kingdom is pictured, there is a transition pictured. Uh, a transition that brings the earthly kingdoms to an end and sets up God's everlasting kingdom. What is not made explicitly clear in Daniel's visions is the reason the earthly kingdoms do not last and the reason that God's kingdom does last. And so you have to really look at the bigger picture of Daniel's story and the story of Israel and Babylon. And what we find as we look at that, that there are indeed um, two basic principles in operation. The two principles that we find as running uh, through the Bible as threads or themes, uh, two principles, one of which has been eternal, the other principle is a temporary principle. It had a beginning, it will have an end, and the temporary principle is the one upon which the earthly kingdoms were all based. The eternal principle is the principle that God's kingdom is built upon. And what we basically come face to face with is the whole theme of the great controversy between good and evil. The principle of good is the eternal principle. The principle of evil is the temporary principle. Uh, there are many philosophies in the world that consider that good and evil has always existed and will always exist. But the Bible's picture of reality is something quite different. The principle of evil had an origin, it will have an end. Jesus in John 8, 44 talked about the beginning of this temporary principle when he said the devil fathered the lie. And in order to father the lie, he had to leave the truth. And so we deal with these two principles all the way through Scripture in some form, some uh, manner, uh, some, some way of looking at life or the other. In Daniel's experience, it was the experience of Israel, uh, Israel itself being a nation, a people that had been raised up by God through Abraham's descendants uh, with the mission that he gave to Abraham, and that is to be a blessing to the world that through Abraham he would bless all the nations of the world. Uh, in a very specific sense that was talking about Messiah that would have to be born into a culture, a, a society that had an understanding of history. Uh, the Word of God had to be part of their heritage. Uh, but this people, Daniel's people, as we see, had failed in their mission. Uh, the, the temple that God had given to be a representation of how God dealt with the temporary principle, uh, with the eternal principle, uh, that temple was actually desolated. It was not preserved, it was not kept pure. It was actually uh, used as a place where they brought in uh, the, the temporary principle. The two ways that Jesus described the principles, the truth and the lie, uh, speak specifically about the truth about God and the lie about God. That was first mentioned in Isaiah 14, where the, the devil who at that time was called Lucifer, the light bearer, son of the morning, he began to entertain ideas that the way to live was to exalt himself. And at the end of that, he said he would be like the Most High. So it seems clear that that is the first statement of the lie, that God is like that. In contrast, Christ came to earth to reveal very plainly the truth. Uh, 
He, he said to Pilate, I was born for this cause. I came into the world to bear witness to the truth. In fact, he told his disciples, I am the truth. Um, he said, I am the way to the Father, I'm the truth about the Father, and I'm the life of the Father. So in this revelation of Jesus Christ, we see the opposite of self-exaltation. We see the, the principle of humility. We see the principle not of selfishness, but of unselfishness. Not the principle of taking, but the principle of giving. And so back to Daniel's people, they had been contaminated with the principle of self-seeking, self-exaltation, which always leads to idolatry and the worship of false gods and, the, and, and pride of self. And so Daniel, as he's given these visions, we have to see them with that background because Daniel knew why his kingdom had collapsed and had been given into the hands of Babylon. He knew why the temple had been destroyed. And he knew that they had a period of punishment, that God would leave them in the hands of Babylon and in captivity until the 70 years that Jeremiah prophesied would be fulfilled. So what we find in Daniel's visions are kingdoms that are built on this temporary principle and they manifested in their own history because none of them last. They only last until some stronger power comes along and knocks them down and puts themselves up. And so this principle just accelerates and expands throughout Earth's history. And contrary to what some would say that it's going to go on forever, Daniel was shown repeatedly, chapter 2, chapter 7, chapter 8, chapters 11 and 12, that indeed those systems, those kingdoms, that which is built upon that principle would come to an end. The end, though, is not a point in time. It's actually pictured as a process over time. The time prophecies of Daniel, first introduced in Daniel 7, and uh, another time prophecy in Daniel 8, and some of the other ones repeated in Daniel 12, the time prophecies actually pointed to the beginning of the end to the beginning of the transition where the earthly systems would be finally brought to a final and complete end and God's system would be restored to this earth. The evidence we have, of course, in Scripture is that God's system has been that which the rest of the universe has been following. It's only this earth that has adopted or embraced this temporary principle. And so this earth has become a, a showplace, a demonstration for how this principle works out. And of course, because of that, we have all of the problems that we have on this earth, if we can trace them back to their root cause. But in Daniel's picture, the pictures that Daniel was given, the transition in chapter 2 was pictured as a stone and the work the stone did and finally ending up becoming God's kingdom. In chapter 7, it's pictured as a process of judgment where there are thrones put in place and books opened and apparently the record reviewed and decisions made for God's system or against God's system. And then Daniel 8, the transition is pictured as the cleansing or restoration or vindication of the sanctuary, that building that the Bible calls the house of God, which is where he showed how he deals with these two principles face to face and demonstrates in ceremonies and types and symbols how he was giving himself continually to meet the needs of sin. And that picture in Daniel 8 is that even though that sanctuary was defiled and trampled, there would, be, there would come a time where it would be restored and vindicated. And the beginning of that process would be on that time prophecy in Daniel 8. So the question then arises, uh, how does God carry out this transition? Is it, is it something that he does totally by himself? Does he just come into Earth's history and intervene and bring it about? Or does he work through human agencies? And if we look at the pattern of judgment, uh, the different judgments that have occurred through the history, particularly the sacred history recorded in Scripture, we see that God always uses people that are in tune with him, that understand the principle of the truth, and they understand how that it is an eternal principle. And he uses them to carry out the beginning aspects of this transition. Uh, an example that we see is in uh, Daniel chapter 5, where Daniel himself is called in to the scene there in Belshazzar's feast, which is the end of the kingdom of Babylon. 
And Daniel is used by God to review the history, which is always the first phase of judgment. In Daniel 7, it's called opening the books. And at the end of that, he then translated the handwriting that was on the wall, and the handwriting on the wall was the verdict and the sentence against Babylon. Uh, again, stating that its time had come to an end and it was going to transition to another kingdom. And so Daniel unfolded both the review of history and the verdict in the sentence. In that chapter before the story is finished, the kingdom of Babylon actually comes to an end. So the execution of the sentence takes place, but Daniel has nothing to do with that. That's the, always the part of transition or judgment that does not happen with human hands. Um, God is in charge of that. Sometimes he uses human agencies in the transition from earthly governments to earthly governments. But at the end, it's plainly stated in Daniel 2 and in Daniel 8 that the final transition, the execution of the sentence against the temporary systems, that will be done without hands. Uh, God tells us in Scripture, vengeance is mine, I will repay. And so God's people are not used at all with that. So again, the question then arises, who did God have in the final transition between the earthly systems and God's everlasting system to cooperate with him in this work of judgment? The evidence is clear from history now that as these time prophecies came to their end or near to their end, there were people in different parts of the world that God raised up interested in the prophecies, studying the prophecies, particularly the time prophecies, knowing that something significant was taking place. And as they studied these prophecies, they began to be impressed and led by God's Spirit to share the messages with others. It's clear that their understanding of it was not complete. Uh, they thought that later parts of judgment were going to occur at the very beginning namely the second coming of Christ, was what was going to happen at the very beginning of the transition. And it became clear to them as the events unfolded that that did not take place. And as they looked for understanding for what actually happened, they realized that they were in the earlier phase of the transition, which is again the phase of not executive judgment, but investigative judgment. Uh, it's, it's very similar to the experience of Christ's disciples that worked with him for three and a half years, proclaiming the gospel message, and they themselves did not fully understand what it was. And when the cross of Jesus occurred, Christ's arrest and his, his crucifixion, they were extremely disappointed. All of their selfish hopes had been destroyed, uh, rightfully so, but they did not even understand the meaning of the cross. And they then had to go through a transition period in their understanding, and Jesus in person did that with Scripture to unfold to them what was actually taking place on that prophecy, which was based on Daniel chapter 9. That prophecy was not about the global end of all things and the setting up of God's kingdom. That prophecy was specifically about the probation of Israel as a nation. But that probation of Israel as a nation is a type or a parallel situation to the global situation that Daniel's other prophecies focused on. We also see that God has often had people presenting messages that at first they did not un understand fully, but they were messages that were given in God's providence. So in the late 1700s, early 1800s, God was raising up the people, studying the prophecies, looking at them, and proclaiming them. And the movement started small and it built and it built and the messages that they proclaimed were specifically related to Daniel 8, the time prophecy there. But they also took elements from the book of Revelation. Messages there that speak about the hour of his judgment having come. Messages from the last part of the book of Revelation, which is a detailed, repetitious coverage of that transition. What it looks like at the end of time. After the seventh trumpet is sounded at the end of chapter 11, it's clear that the, the time of judgment is announced. And the last 11 chapters of Revelation detail that judgment in its investigative phases, in its verdict and sentences, and in its execution. And so God raises up a people, and that 
movement we have called now the, the Great Advent Movement. Uh, it was the Second Advent of Christ, so the, it's come sometimes called the Second Advent Movement. It was not at all identified with Seventh-day Adventism in its early years because there was no, no people that, as part of the movement that were keeping the seventh day. That did not come to their understanding until after the time came and passed that they were expecting Christ to come to this earth. And as they studied the topic of the sanctuary, which Daniel 8 specifically says will begin to be restored and cleansed at that time, as they studied the sanctuary, they began to understand better the types and symbols and the meaning of what the Day of Atonement was all about. And as they understood that, they were taking figuratively into the most holy place. They understood more of the Ark of the Covenant, the tables of the law that were inside the Ark, the Sabbath that was inside the table, uh, tables of the law there. They also understood better the other symbols in the sanctuary of what happens to this temporary principle. It is temporary. It will pass away and it will disappear. And those identified with it will not survive forever in any mode of existence. And that probably was best pictured in the sanctuary by the pile of ashes that was by the altar of burnt offerings. And that is the end of this other principle is non-existence. And so they began to realize that contrary to one of the earliest lies of the devil, that when you live for yourself, you will not die. They realized, no, you will die. And death is really death. It's just not another form of existence. And so these significant doctrine tru doctrinal truths um, the second coming of Jesus, the cleansing of the sanctuary and what that meant in a, in a uh, process of judgment. Also the messages that brought these, the three angels' messages. And then particularly at the end of the third angel's message, the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus and the Sabbath of the commandments and the, and the non-immortality of the wicked. These were the truths that came, they came to understand and these are described in that order. They were multiple threads. If you study the history, they didn't come all in one line. Different people brought different concepts in. And sometimes the people that brought these concepts first to the, for, to the understanding of others, they didn't actually hang on to them and keep them long term. Some of them gave them up and went uh, and left the movement. But as these understandings came together in a group of people um, that began to to share these and publish them, there was a body of people that were actually forming that later became known as the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Uh, some almost 20 years after the passing of the time, uh, 1844. And so that's the background for these Adventist pioneers. The individuals that came from various churches various backgrounds, came together with an understanding of prophecy, with an understanding of, of Scripture, and the transition that is take, was taking place between the earthly systems and God's system and began to proclaim these truths. Um, the history is fascinating to read. They were, they were men and women of uh, deep sincerity, but there was one of the landmarks that they, in retrospect, clearly neglected. And it's the landmark that was mentioned, that truth that's mentioned in the last of the three angels' messages, uh, Revelation 14, verse 12. Those that will endure this transition process, um, the verse there says, here is the patience or the endurance of the saints. And it's pictured there that they will keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And again, as they looked into that most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary, the commandments of God are clearly there in those tables of stone inside the Ark of the Covenant. But the faith of Jesus was really not well appreciated. That is best understood as you look at the Ark, that is the gold that's there. The gold, the Ark itself was made of wood covered with gold. It represents the humanity and the divinity of Jesus Christ. And the lid on the top of the Ark, uh, Usually in English it's called the mercy seat. That was solid gold. So the picture there is a picture of Jesus Christ and inside of Jesus Christ is the law of God. 
That's why, we're, why we read in Psalm 40, when it says there, gives the words of Jesus as he's planning to come to earth. He says, Lo, I come in the volume of the book it is written of me to do thy will, O God, yea, thy law is within my heart. So Jesus is the picture of the ark with the law in his heart. And they didn't really emphasize that dimension of Jesus that's represented by the gold, his divine faith and love at work. They focused on the law that was inside the box. And they actually presented it often without Jesus. It was the law by itself. And so for years, they, they developed this method of presenting the law, defending the law, and particularly the Sabbath of the fourth commandment in a way that left Jesus out of it. And as Ellen White described it, uh, preach, they preached Christless sermons. They preached the law of the law by itself until they were as dry as the hills of Gilboa. And the biblical reference to the location where Saul was killed and Jonathan and David put a curse on them that, that no rain should fall on them. And so the, the Advent believers, as true as their uh, commitment to these truths were, their experience and their in the completeness of the message was not uh, adequate to complete the mission and as we look at the years the decades of the advent movement during the years during the lifespan of the first generation pioneers uh, it's a very vitally important story to recount to recapture to understand because they are working god's leading them step by step but it's clear, too, that God is attempting to give to them what they were missing, that which they had neglected. And in the 1880s, that truth of the faith of Jesus, um, not just the law by itself, but the law and the gospel, in the words of Ellen White, going hand in hand, that message came to them in a very strong confrontation. Uh, amazingly, of all the first generation pioneers that were still alive, some had already died, of all that first generation, the evidence points to the fact that only Ellen White understood the significance of that message of the law and the gospel going together. The rest of her generation either did not grasp it and somewhat ignored it or actually actively opposed it. And the rest of the history of the decades of her life are basically best understood in light of those decisions and the fallout that came from those decisions. The fallout being that there was a window of opportunity for that message to be received based on world events, world situations, and then the window of opportunity closed. And when you reject light, you're always vulnerable to a counterfeit. And into the Advent movement came the closest counterfeit to the genuine message. The genuine message of the law and the gospel together, again pictured by the Ark of the Covenant with the law inside, that means living... Um, as Jesus Christ lived with the law written in your heart, the new covenant experience, this, this light as, was, as it was rejected was replaced by a counterfeit where the teaching came in that God is in everything and the teaching of pantheism. And the man whose ministry had most closely reproduced the ministry of Christ, the, the ministry of ministry not only to people's souls but also their bodies, the medical missionary work um, that was promoted most significantly by Dr. John Harvey Kellogg. He became the one that became most confused and began to promote the ideas of pantheism. And the two messengers that God had used to present the message of righteousness by faith of the law and the gospel together, A.T. Jones and E.J. Wagner, also went with Dr. Kellogg. Uh, as you look at the reasons for why this happened, it seems clear it's primarily due to the opposition that they experienced. Ellen White says that Dr. Kellogg, because of the opposition he'd been working against from within the church, that his response to that opposition actually caused him to put on the coat of irritation and retaliation, in her words. And whenever you, you adopt an attitude of bitterness to your enemies, you always lose your spiritual balance, the balance of judgment. And so that's why he became vulnerable. In a sense, uh, Jones and Wagner also suffered with the same response to their enemies and that of uh, bitterness 
and confusion of spiritual judgment. So that is the summary of our history, at least through the time of, of Dr. Kellogg. Um, Ellen White began to write during those years that we would have to remain in this world many more years. We may have to, she said, because of insubordination. But the danger uh, of God's people at that point, the danger was that we would blame God with the results of our own wrong course of action. That the delay, the fact that the work was not finished, we would, we would think, well, that has to, has to do with God. God. God is the one who has not wrapped this thing up yet. And we're just waiting on Him and waiting on Him without realizing that the delay was caused by the actions of God's own people. And that's thoroughly documented in the, in the statements of Ellen White. And so the lesson that we have to look at is number one, what is the message that God has for the world at this time of transition? What are the elements, all of the elements of it that, that, are, that is needed? And the message is not simply theological truths, even though concepts are vitally important because ideas change things. If we have wrong ideas, we actually do not have right actions because actions, uh, ideas produce actions. So what are, what are the concepts that are vitally important? But along with that, and another vitally important uh, connection is that what do these ideas look like in real life? Because again, God's teachings are not something that we have just in our head, but we have it in our heart. We have it in our life. We live it. And so how does that look? And what will it look like? And the, the, the message is quite clear that Isaiah 58, the chapter there, pictures what God's people should be doing during the Day of Atonement. We live now in what is called the antitypical Day of Atonement. This is the fulfillment of all the other symbolic Days of Atonement. What should we be doing during this time? The life that we should love, how we should be blessing others, how we should be embodying the principle that lasts forever. Because as we, as we learn to live that principle here, not only do we prepare for God's kingdom, but we prepare others as well. We are a witness to that. And so as we go back and look at our history, we must see the vitally important nature of those things that God was doing at that time, raising up these people, giving them messages. But we must also see their mistakes because it's clear from history, it's inescapable. We have to face the fact that they did not finish the mission and they were told repeatedly that they could have. And so coming to grips with those things, we, we were actually brought to a feeling of, of, of uh, sorrow. Uh, we, we understand more how Christ feels. In 1902, 1904, Ellen White was writing, the disappointment of Christ is beyond description. And so it's not that we are waiting on God, but it seems clear that He is waiting on us. And as we begin to learn that history, we learn the important facts that were laid down and should not be moved. We learn from the mistakes that has caused the delay. And we're brought to an attitude of sorrow and repentance uh, in the spirit of Daniel. We can say, uh, God, we have sinned and our fathers have sinned. And so we begin to learn from the mistakes of the past so that we do not continue to repeat them in our own generation. Our human nature is the same. The messages are the same. We're in the transition period. Um, the time has begun. The process has been delayed. But God still has a work for us to do. And as we enter into a, a spirit of humility, which is again the essence of the principle of God's kingdom, we begin to learn what we still need as a people, as individuals, and we're able then to share with the world more effectively how that every one of our doctrines are expressions of the principle of the truth, the principle of unselfishness, the principle that will last forever. And we prepare people for what's coming. I like to describe what's coming in two ways, because as we, as we talk about preparing people for Christ's coming, um, there's actually two aspects to it with one, one core principle. The one core principle is the principle of unselfishness. But the two aspects is that before Christ comes, there's going to be the greatest battle between these two principles the world has ever seen. And so we're preparing people by their own experience and by their own 
uh, depth of commitment and loyalty to this principle, we're preparing them to stand through that storm where they will have faith and love to the end and that will enable them to endure. They will be victorious. And so we're, that's the first part of the preparation. The other part of the preparation is preparing them for heaven. And that is a place where there is no unselfish, there is no selfishness. There is only unselfishness. And how can people be prepared for that unless they learn how to live that way here? And so the picture there is, is quite plain. Parable after parable of Jesus, if we do not embrace the principles of the kingdom, if we do not internalize them, if they don't become part of us, if our, if our vessels are not filled with the oil, um, then we're really not prepared to move through that transition, to be used of God, to prepare others, and ourselves be prepared to stand in that time. So our history is vitally important. The history does not stand by itself. It's thoroughly rooted in the prophecies of Scripture. The prophecies themselves are but expressions of how these two principles look. In the, in, in the past history, as prophecy has been fulfilled, and continuing on into the future. And indeed how that only God's principle will last forever. The other principle will indeed come to an end. We can see evidence of it in our life today, in people's lives. Uh, there's one principle that holds people together. There's another principle that drives them apart. As you live for yourself, and that matures fully, you are finally all by yourself. No one wants to be around you. Um, but if you live for others, there's true unity, there's true selflessness, and that is the oneness that Christ's disciples had after they embraced the cross and the, this principle that was described in Acts 1 and 2. They were in one place, in one accord, and then God could recognize that by pouring out His Spirit. That's what we're waiting for as we receive these messages, these principles, um, as we ought, the Spirit will come and will empower the message to go to all the world. Right now, we seem to be growing as a church, but growth is not by itself a sign of health. Um, and as you look at the growth of the church, it's not even keeping up with the growth of the world. So something has to change, and the evidences from our past is that we've been called to learn those lessons, uh, to embrace them as Christ's disciples were willing to in their day. At least 11 of them were. We know one of them was not. But God help us not to be a Judas. Uh, but uh, to be willing to be cleansed of the principle of, of selfishness and self-exaltation like the other 11 were, and then be used by God to finish the work. That's my desire. That's what I hope your desire is as we consider the truths of prophecy in our Adventist history and we embrace the message in its fullness. God bless you.